I hope you've had a really good day and a half of sessions and of time to catch up with uh, colleagues and to meet new colleagues. Uh, I have to say, speaking for myself, this seems to have been a particularly um, uh, good meeting for um, reconnecting with people that I hadn't had an opportunity to see in a while, and I hope it's uh, I hope that's one of the things uh, you've all been able to do here. Just before we move on to our closing plenary, there are a couple of things that I do want to do. Um, let me remind you that in your packet there are a number of um, bits of paper that have dates of things on them. Uh, that includes our fall meeting, and I hope to see uh, just about everybody here at our fall meeting in December. That will be in Washington, D.C. Uh, there is information on our joint meeting with the JISC, which will be in Edinburgh in early July, and I hope at least a few of the folks here will be able to join us for that. Uh, there's also information on a couple of other things, including how to uh, get on CNI Announce if for some reason you're not subscribed to it. Uh, I would urge you to uh, do so and uh, use that to help keep track of uh, some of the things that we're doing here. I'd like to take a moment to thank a few folks. Uh, notably, I'd like to call for a round of applause for all of the presenters. We had a tremendous number of breakout sessions here, and at least the ones I sampled, uh, was able to sample, were really super. Uh, we, I think I speak for all of us when I say how much we appreciate people who um, gave their time and expertise to make those happen and that we'll appreciate them even more um, if they remember to uh, share their PowerPoints or other materials so that we can put them up on the website and uh, those who couldn't get to the sessions can also share in that work. So please join me in a round of applause for our speakers. And I'd also like to thank the um, CNI staff um, and uh, for all of their work in making the meeting run smoothly. Uh, there's been an awful lot of um, logistics, and uh, the best kind of logistics are the invisible kind of logistics. Uh, I think that mostly these logistics uh, rose to the invisible, and please join me in thanking them for that. And now um, I get to make an introduction uh, of our um, closing uh, plenary speaker, who will, I think, bring our session to a uh, flamboyant conclusion um, and send you away with an awful lot of things to think about. I believe at least some of you have had an opportunity to meet Liz Lyon over the years. She's the director of UKOLN based at the uh, University of Bath and has been the author of a number of um, pretty important reports about um, e-science and in particular some of the data management issues around e-science which have circulated in the uh, UK and in the US and elsewhere over the last few years. Um, she's been one of the uh, real synthesizers of development in that area as well as running some uh, innovative and pioneering projects herself or uh, being part of the teams that ran them. One of the things that I think it's helpful to know about Liz, and I'm not going to give you a long bio of Liz's um, contributions, uh, is that she actually is trained as a um, research molecular biochemist. So she really has 
um, an understanding of what goes on, you know, in laboratories that isn't theoretical. And that's very important, I think, when we talk about e-science and especially when we talk about the realities of e-science beyond a few kind of marquee projects and really start thinking about how the lives of working scientists in all disciplines are likely to change and the interactions between um, professional scientists, amateur scientists, librarians, data curators, information technologists, and others get rearranged in this brave new world of um, e-research and e-scholarship. I think that uh, Liz is um, superbly positioned to give us some wonderful insights into that, and please join me in welcoming her. Uh, I'm going to talk prim primarily about this report, the Open Science Report, that I published last November. Uh, it was commissioned by the GISC, and it looked at a whole range of open science issues. Uh, I, this, as I say, was last November, uh, and it's now April 2010, so things have moved on. Uh, there is a set of slides uh, from eResearch Australasia here, which actually keeps quite closely to the report. But the talk that you're going to hear now is a completely new one uh, and builds on the information in the report. So please, if you haven't read it, download it. Uh, I think it's quite a good uh, bedtime read. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to look at uh, four areas. Uh, and um, I'm going to draw on, on some experience of some projects that I've been involved with, as Cliff has mentioned. And uh, I want to start off by thinking about scale. And we've heard quite a lot in various uh, presentations about the data deluge and about uh, issues of data scale. And, and I want to look at a particular uh, perspective. And the first one that I want to look at is from the perspective of well, let's think about a scientist in the lab, and in this case, it's a chemist. So, it's probably many of you have got chemistry faculty back at your institutions. You'll have chemists working at the uh, coalface, and uh, this chemist happens to be a crystallographer. He's quite a, or she is quite a sort of switched on chemist because they're using a mobile device um, to record their laboratory uh, methodologies and their results. So it's, it's like an electronic lab notebook. And in the Open Science Report, there is a little section on uh, electronic lab notebooks. So the crystallographer in the local lab um, works. They have to uh, think about the chemical structures of the crystals that they're creating, and they want to uh, analyze them, they want to uh, synthesize them, and they want to characterize these crystal structures. And most of the time that works fine, but sometimes they'll have a crystal structure that's particularly difficult. It might be a particularly small crystal structure. And so at that point, they need to use a different service. So they might go to a national crystallographic service, and this one happens to be in Southampton. So I come from Bath, so let's say there's a researcher at Bath, at the local lab, and they've got to take their sample to uh, a crystallography service, a national service at the University of Southampton. And so they've got different hardware there, different equipment, uh, bigger scaled equipment, and you know most of the time they handle the uh, crystal structures, it's fine, but all of a sudden they may also get a crystal structure that's a little difficult to characterize. So they decide to take it to the synchrotron, so this is the synchrotron, the diamond light source in Oxfordshire, and the National Crystallographic Service has got beam time on one of the beam lines there, and they have a whole different set of uh, equipment there, and the sample goes to Oxford and goes through a pipeline process there. And what we find is that there are um, different workflows in each different place, your lab probably has a different workflow to the workflow at Southampton or at Bath. And so what we've got here are 
far from seamless data integration issues. And we've got a new project, and I'm starting with uh, some quite sort of nitty gritty stuff here, uh, a new project called uh, I2S2, which is funded by the GISC, and we're working with a range of partners to look at these data integration issues across uh, a range of scale. And as you've probably gathered from what I've said so far, we're looking at data integration across geographical boundaries and also across institutional boundaries. And uh, we're looking at some technical metadata issues, but we're also looking at uh, cost-benefit issues. So we're working with Neil Beagree, who's developed the Keeping Research Data Safe model, to look at where, at which points, intervention will realize cost benefits. And I'd like to share with you um, some early results. So we've been involved in the requirements gathering phase, trying to understand what's actually happening uh, at these different points. And so I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, if you have a quick scan through, uh, there's some interesting points here which I'll pick out. So the poor old researcher back at the coalface has to fill in multiple proposals, multiple forms in order to get their sample through these various channels, whether it's at the coalface, whether it's at the national service, or whether it's at uh, an international global service like Diamond. We have a fairly well-established metadata schema uh, as part of the eCrystals National Service at Southampton, but there's variable standards, different metadata used in other sites. As I say, the workflow varies from lab to lab. Some of it is reasonably formulaic, being crystallography, but some of it's quite complex and, and unrecorded. And for my mind, worst of all, People take their data samples, their crystal samples, to uh, these facilities. They get data off the beam line, and there's millions, billions of pounds invested in these services, but we take our data off on a USB stick. How safe is that? Or on a laptop? So, so this whole project has raised a lot of issues that we're starting to address with the hope of streamlining. Uh, and overcoming some of these challenges of scale. So that's crystallography. So what I'd like to do now is to uh, move field slightly and think about some bio stuff. And this time I'm going to go uh, up the coast, I think, if my geography serves me right, to the Broad Institute, which is part of MIT and Harvard, which is a, a genome center. There's a very nice um, display here uh, in the atrium of the Broad, where you can actually see the data flying off the sequencing machines. And at the moment, they're sequencing the genome of the African elephant. So they've got 117 sequencers, sequencing machines, each churning out 96 parallel streams of data. Let's get the right button this time. Just to give you, I don't know if you, can you see that all right in the back? It's, it's coming out a bit strange here. But there are streams of data here coming out. So you're probably aware that the human, ge human genome was first sequenced back in 2000. And they were using first generation sequences then. And the sort of sequences that they've got at the Broad are Illumina sequences, which are second generation. And you can probably see from the table up here from Nature that the costs are coming down. Uh, but now they're thinking about third generation sequences. And there's a whole range of new companies coming into the market with new technologies to try and sequence faster, quicker, and cheaper than before. And this is resulting in a technology race to the market. And the real goal is to sequence a human genome for under $1,000. And some of the companies are promising this within the next few years as well. So what does this mean for us, who have to think about managing some of this data and providing cyber infrastructure to manage the data and services associated with that? Well, there are a number of requirements for data storage that we need. 
and I've listed some of them up there. They're, they're fairly obvious, really. It has to be cost effective, it has to be secure, but equally, we need to be able to port data to and from different services easily. We need to be able to analyze the data so that we can get new knowledge from it. And ideally, what we'd really like to do is move genome sequencing out of these big data centers, and maybe you can sit at your local coffee shop with your laptop and do a quick bit of genome sequencing at your leisure. So enter the cavalry of cloud services, and, and I've, I've sat in a few sessions that have been talking about cloud computing. Uh, and there's quite a lot of hype, a lot of media coverage for cloud computing services, and all the big players are there, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft. They're all there, and they are developing services relatively rapidly uh, to help computing services uh, and data services manage their data. Not all, I should say, of the hype and the media coverage is good, as you'll see from the bottom right-hand corner there. And this table, I hope you can see it in the back, uh, but this table from Nature Biotechnology uh, shows that there is a real ramping up of the companies that are providing cloud storage for bio, for pharma companies. And there's an increasing range of services being supplied and an increasing range of clients as well using those services. So over here uh, on this column, we can see all the people that I've just mentioned, the blue chip players, a range of services being offered. And here on the right, you can see some of the big farmers and the smaller startup companies that are actually buying into these services. So Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, US Department of Energy, they're all there. And they're actually using these cloud services to manage biodata. And interestingly, uh, I think this is probably the first, if not one of the first, uh, published articles that describes uh, sequencing, and in fact it's looking for single nucleotide polymorphism, in other words DNA variation in a sequence, using cloud computing. And this came out in uh, late 2009. And um, you'll see that, in fact, this has been published by colleagues uh, up the road in Baltimore. And it's using Amazon Elastic Cloud services and uh, some open source software called Crossbow. So it's actually happening. And I mentioned that the first human genome was uh, sequenced back in 2000. So we're now uh, a decade on. And you may have seen that Nature's just produced a, a really nice um, special issue commemorating uh, the first decade uh, post-genome. And you can see from the uh, nice graphic here that uh, the cost, as I say, is declining, but the number of human genomes sequenced is increasing. And there are now about 24 published human genomes and over 200 that are unpublished. They've been sequenced, but they're not published yet. So real growth. So what does this actually mean? Well, this is Leroy Hood, and he's the director of the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. And he's a man with a vision, and he's thinking about how the advent of uh, more widely available genomic data is going to affect the treatment of disease and how we approach health uh, and therapy. And he's got a concept of P4 medicine. So he thinks that it's going to be predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory. And this is radically different to how medicine is right now. So he envisages a world where every patient's genome will be sequenced. Your genome will be the basis of your medical record. And this means that once you have the patient's genome, you can start to predict what sort of diseases they may be susceptible to. And you can actually treat the patient on an individual basis rather than treating the disease as a whole. 
That's radically different to how we approach medicine right now. And for those of you that are in an institution that has a medical faculty or some bio faculty, this will impact on how you start to think about information support and research data management support. And there's a, an article just come out in Science, uh, which is from uh, his lab, his colleagues, where they've sequenced the genomes of a complete family of four, so both parents and the boy and the girl, to start to identify uh, traits and dispositions to particular disease. So this is uh, a real sort of first, if you like. So thinking about scale, which is where we started, we need to think about genome scale biology and what that is going to mean for all of us providing information services and data service support to faculty in that area. And we have to think about genomic data as a commodity, which really radically changes how we think about data in this particular context. Now, this is a, a slightly different project. This is SAGE Bionetworks, and um, I've been privileged to be uh, part of this new initiative. This is Stephen Friend, and um, he used to work for Merck Pharmaceuticals, big company, and he left Merck to set up SAGE Bionetworks, which is a not-for-profit enterprise, and he's also a man with a vision. And his vision is that a whole load of clinical data, genetics data, genome data will be openly available for sharing between scientists in the SAGE Commons. And he's thinking about cancer data, obesity data, diabetes data, all freely available in a way that it's not at the moment for uh, scientists to share, to mine, to interrogate, uh, and to gain new knowledge from it. And there's a congress uh, in a week or so's time in San Francisco where uh, some of the developments that we've been working on for the Sage Commons will be shared. And very interestingly, just this morning in the Wall Street Journal, today's Wall Street Journal, there's an article written uh, and with an interview with Stephen called My Data, Your Data, Our Data. Uh, and it's all about the, the SAGE initiative and some associated initiatives. And I'd just like to read to you uh, the, the last paragraph, so I'll just get somewhere where I can see. Many of the scientists agree it will be increasingly difficult for their colleagues to resist cultural forces that insist on more sharing. My son is four. By the time he's 15, his genomic data will probably be on Facebook. <laughs> So what, what they're saying here is that the way people's um, leisure lives uh, are conducted is actually affecting uh, scientific research. So if patients demand their data be shared, scientists almost have no choice. So again, if, if you have faculty in the medical area or in the bio area, these sorts of trends will affect you. And there are already a whole bunch of people who have shared their personal genomic data. And the number's increasing. Uh, this is one of the more high-profile um, gentlemen who have shared their data. This is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And there are also increasingly uh, a number of personal genomics companies, you may have heard of 23andMe, DecodeMe, where if you spend about $400, uh, send it off to 23andMe, you get a kit, uh, you send them a saliva sample, and they will analyze your genomic data from that sample. And people are sh customers are sharing their data on the web, uh, in a very, very open way. I think it raises some really, really interesting questions of ethics, of privacy, that your ethics committees in your institutions will need to start thinking about if they're not already. But of course, as we know only too well, many researchers do not want to share their data. They will not share their data, and there are a whole bunch of reasons for that, and some of them I, I cover in the Open Science Report, and some of them are perfectly valid. 
It may be because uh, the, the data isn't ready to be shared. It may be because it's sensitive data, whatever. But also, as this RIN report, the Research Information Network uh, report from last year, where they did a, a number of case studies from the life sciences, um, researchers are also extremely reluctant to use other people's data. They don't trust each other. <laughs> they won't share their data because they don't trust each other and they won't use other people's data. So there's some real interesting cultural issues to overcome there. Okay. On we go. So what can we do to um, help people to share their data and to make it worth their while? And in the Open Science Report, there's a section on um, rewards, on incentive, credentials, uh, around citation and attribution. And I just want to say a few words today about that. So in recent uh, issues of nature biotechnology, uh, nature cell biology, there have been calls for action around um, how to make uh, data citable and how to be able to uh, attribute uh, ownership and uh, provenance to that data. And, and in the sessions that I've been to at this conference, I've also heard a lot of discussion about citation of data sets and associated supplementary information. And um, in PLOS, Computational Biology, uh, last year, there was an attempt to develop a, a metric that took citation of data sets, uh, blog postings, wiki entries into account as a new metric, and they called it the scholar factor, a new metric to uh, help to attract contributions and participation and data sharing. And if we start to think about um, citation, we can think about levels of granularity. And we're, we're used to metrics for um, uh, journals. PLOS talks about article level metrics. But in the sessions I've been to, we've been hearing about citing data. And of course, it's hugely complex. We have very large databases. We have data sets. We have data elements in tables. So there's a big question for me about what level of granularity do you need to be able to provide citation services? Do you need to be able to cite an annotation? So many of these genome sequences are annotated. Do you need to be able to cite an annotation? And then there's an initiative called the Concept Web Alliance where they're thinking about um, how a concept can be described in RDF by a number of triples. And uh, Berend Mons and Jan Veltrop talk about nano publications and nano citations and micro attribution. So what level of granularity do we need to have functionality to be able to cite at a level which um, delivers the uh, services and the attribution that we need? And I went to the um, presentation about data sites. I've heard reference to AUCID. There are a number of different services that we can start to draw on which are providing persistent identification to enable these services to uh, be delivered. But the complexity challenges are considerable. Let me give you an example. I'd like to go back to SAGE. So, SAGE is all about sharing network models, and I talked about network biology. And Stephen Friend uh, envisages the sharing of multiple data sets, might be genetic data, might be clinical data, environmental data, which are interrelated to see what the variation and the implications are from one data set to another, which affect a patient's uh, disease prognosis. And these are displayed as network models, as visualizations, if you like, using Cytoscape, which is a visualization tool. And that's a sort of typical um, network. So how do you cite that? 
This is the work that we're looking at. We're just beginning it. It is very much preliminary. And the first thing we have to do is to understand the workflow of the biologists, of the clinicians that are creating this data, and understand what their requirements are in the citation process. So this work, as I say, is just beginning. We're hoping to um, talk to some of the modelers and to some of the scientists in San Francisco at the SAGE Congress. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll be able to share some of those results with you. But I think this conveys the complexity of the citation requirement and the attribution requirement. So SAGE is very much a participatory initiative. And what I'd like to do now is to look at some of the different ways in which uh, participation for data curation uh, is being addressed. In the open science report, I try to get a handle on what we mean by openness. And so far in this talk, I've been thinking about access and data sharing, which is what you see along the x-axis here. But openness can also be about participation. And that's what I've tried to um, display up the y-axis here. So we can think about the lone scholar, not always in the humanities, sometimes in the humanities. And we can think about um, volunteers and interested amateurs being participating in some sort of uh, science initiative. And we can think about citizen scientists, the public being involved in science. And there are a number of different projects which are presented here. It's just a, a selection, if you like, which we can position on this curve, on this continuum, depending on how open they are. But it's not just about this. Here's a different graph. If we think about um, the amount of work all the functions, all the services, all the effort, all the tasks that we need to do in order to manage the research data that's coming out of all these new experimentation procedures. I've listed a few on the right-hand side there. We need services for annotation, audit, data cleansing, metadata schema, ontologies, and so on. There's a whole list of stuff that needs to be done. Who's going to do all that? So down here on the x-axis, we've got some notion of capability. So the scientist, the professional scientist, is the subject expert. They know their data inside out. But they haven't got any time. So they've got the capability, but they don't have any capacity. They don't have the time to do what's needed. And over here, we've got people out there, the public, Galaxy Zoo, great example, who've got real interest, real enthusiasm, and they have the time, but they don't always have the skills. So we've got this dilemma, which I, I've tried to characterize on this decaying exponential graph, of how do we balance the requirements of capacity and capability? to help us to curate and manage the data that's, that's being thrown at us today. So as I say, let's look at some examples, some possible approaches. So this is Wiki Pathways. So this is a wiki-based initiative where um, biologists are sharing their metabolic pathways. So it's an absolutely traditional wiki. You can edit it, you can comment on it, you can add to it, and it's growing. Uh, there are, I think, about a thousand uh, pathways, metabolic pathways being shared and about a thousand users. That's pretty much a handful, but it's a start. Let's look at another example. So we go back to crystallography here, and this is ChemSpider, uh, which is a service from the Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, which manages chemical structures. And they're very much into bringing the community, the crystallography community, the chemists, to help to curate their own data. So they have a manual, 
to help people, a guide. And you can log on as a beta tester, a curator, or a depositor. And as such, you can help to curate the data. So you can edit it, you can add to it, and you can tidy it up. And they have a notion of master curators who have oversight. So they check all the work that's done by the curators. So this is quite a nice example, I think, of community curation. Could it be ported to other disciplines? Is it being addressed in other disciplines in this way? I think it's a nice example. And you know, if you've got an iPhone, you can do it on the move. There's an app that allows you to do it on the move. So you can do it sitting on the bus. And also, quite innovatively, I think, they're using uh, gaming approaches to attract people to participate. So they've developed this spectral game, uh, which allows you to, if you like, take part in a sort of semi-competitive way uh, and they score, they've got top ranking scores, and it's a way of attracting people into participating. So just moving on, if you remember the um, uh, open continuum, at the top was citizens, citizen science. And in the open science report, uh, I, there's a whole section on citizen science. And one of the uh, aspects that I particularly liked was a comparison of citizen journalism and citizen science. And what can scientists learn from citizen journalism? And since writing the report, uh, there's a nice blog post uh, from this guy, Martin Bolam. And he's a journalist, but he's also a historian, so he's a citizen historian. And he's got this notion of the curation gap. So he characterized professional journalists, and then he characterized citizen journalists. And I liked this, and I thought, well, we could apply this to scientists. So you can characterize professional scientists in a very similar way, and you can think about enthusiastic amateurs, if you like, the citizen scientists a whole unta relatively untapped resource. So let's look at some examples and see what the issues might be. So this is a, a project which is being led by Intel in Berkeley in California. And they're asking the question, what if every mobile dev device had an air quality sensor? OK. So just picture this, you've got your mobile phone, and it's got an air quality sensor in it. So anywhere you go, you can take a reading. And they're developing that um, hardware. There you are, you can see the uh, very preliminary, I think, um, hardware there. But their vision is quite exciting. So they envisage that uh, you'll be able to use your mobile device and send in readings from wherever you happen to be. It'll go into a server, they'll synthesize the data, and they'll send you out text messages to tell you where the difficult areas are in terms of air quality in the particular city that you happen to be in. And then they also envisage having signs up in our urban areas telling you which way to walk so that you go in the healthy areas. Okay, and they're calling this participatory urbanism. And I, I think this is quite interesting. It, it reminded me of um, Google Street View in, in terms of privacy issues. Um, you know, if, you're, if you ha happen to suffer from asthma, uh, and, and you have the, the data sent to you and so on. Some interesting privacy issues there. But of course, one person's view on privacy is not necessarily the next person's view on privacy. So there's some interesting areas there to explore, I think, as well, for our ethics committees who are going to be very busy in the future, I feel. 
So here's another example, a slightly different uh, example of citizen science. So the BBC uh, has been quite active in this area with an initiative called Lab UK. And uh, the BBC has been looking for particular topics, scientific challenges, that are suited to mass participation. And it's got some quite high-profile scientists, as you can see, there's Robert Winston, uh, promoting this approach. And it's starting to have some real success. And one of the things I like about Lab UK is it's working with professional scientists to develop these initiatives. And it publishes a, a list of criteria so that if you've got an idea as a scientist, you can decide whether it's worth submitting it to see whether they'll take it forward. But better still, they assure that they will publish all the results from these citizen science experiments in peer-reviewed journals. And indeed, they are doing that. And, and David Attenborough, you can see him on the web uh, promoting the results. Uh, so the results of Sex ID have been published uh, in a peer-reviewed journal. So my question really is, how will this go down with your faculty? What are their attitudes going to be to working with the public in this way? I think there's going to be some interesting um, discussions and uh, deliberations to see whether this is something that your institutions will want to take part in. So that takes us on to the, the final section that I want to talk about, and to think about how our institutions are responding to these changes that are coming up. And there is a section in the report which um, starts to look at some of these issues. And this is uh, the University of Edinburgh's informatics building. Uh, so this is one way of responding uh, to the growth in <coughs> informatics. I don't think we're all lucky enough to be able to have a beautiful new building like that. In the Open Science Report, uh, I developed a very, very simple checklist, as I called it. So uh, an Open Science Institutional Readiness Checklist. So it's 10 very quick questions that you can pose to your senior management team to see whether they're on the ball. And if you have a look, it covers strategic planning, it covers structures, policies, and it covers library and information services as well, and how engaged they are with data informatics. And there's a whole section on data informatics in the report. And in this talk, I've covered uh, some of those areas, and I want to draw on some specific examples in this last section to show you some uh, ways in which some institutions are tackling some of these challenges. So one way uh, that some institutions are tackling high throughput biology is to concentrate their initiatives and their efforts in some new centers, some new institutes for high throughput biology. And so UCLA has a center. University of British Columbia has a centre, and Johns Hopkins has a centre just up the road for high throughput biology. So this is thinking about gene sequencing, microarray experiments, and concentrating that effort. We heard some talks about cloud computing, and I've said a few words about it. Well, this is quite a nice initiative. Uh, so this is from the Triangle Universities, North Carolina, who three of them are collaborating to um, develop uh, a new cyber infrastructure for data, which is based on cloud computing. So they're going to share their cloud services and uh, develop policies and practice collaboratively for the benefit of all three campuses. So it's a kind of regional solution, if you like. I liked that one. Another thing that some institutions are doing is completely restructuring their information services. So this is uh, Queensland, QUT in Australia, uh, did a presentation last year at eResearch Australasia presenting this new structure. 
And if you have a look, they're bringing together people like visualizers, high performance computing people, as well as data librarians, liaison librarians, into an e-research support structure. So again, this is something that your directors of information services, or you yourselves, may want to consider doing. Now, in the title of the talk was the word constellations, and you're probably thinking, well, she hasn't mentioned constellations yet. So here we are. So at RPI in New York, they have the notion of research constellations, which I rather like. So the idea is that they're bringing together the stars in different disciplines together to work in particular areas. So areas like biocomputation and bioinformatics, tetherless world and integrative systems biology. So multidisciplinary groups, team science. But what I would like to suggest is um, that doesn't quite go far enough because given the, what we've just been seeing, what about graphic designers to help us deal with these, these increasingly uh, complex visualizations? Animators to help us use gaming technology to attract punters in, to help us curate our data? I've listed a few ethical and socio-cultural issues. We need social scientists in the team to help us with some of those cultural differences. And I know that there are going to be some IPR issues associated with all of this. So we need some legal expertise as well. University of Michigan. So they've got an NSF uh, uh, bit of funding to set up an open data program, and they've got an open data faculty. And if you have a look, it's drawing on people from, again, different disciplines and they've actually got an open data faculty. So this is, again, thinking about how their institutions are supporting open science. And this article that I referenced earlier from Genome Biology, which is produced from colleagues uh, here locally, if you have a look at where they're from, and I'll have to step closer, so the first author is from the Department of Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins. Second author is from the Center for Bioinformatics. And the third author is from the iSchool at the University of Maryland. That's a really nice combination. So one of the last points that I want to make is about the changing role of library and information scientists. And in the UK, we have an iSchool now, University of Sheffield, it's the first UK iSchool. And they run courses in chemoinformatics to help the researchers and the new graduate trainees to understand the issues in chemistry. And then Illinois, their iSchool has a course which specializes in data curation. So these are all initiatives to help to develop either faculty or to develop the up and coming information scientists and librarians so that they have the skills when they come into our libraries and into our institutions, they have the skills and the knowledge and the know-how to help the researchers to manage their data. So a few take-homes, I'm almost at the end. We need to think of some fairly pragmatic solutions to help the researchers to change their ways and they have to be embedded in the workflow to help them to share their data so that this prospect of open science can really happen. And I think critical to that is to be able to demonstrate attribution for a particular data sequence, for a particular data set. And we have to work with the funding organizations and the research assessors so that this is built into research assessment frameworks. It's not in the UK research assessment at the moment, and I don't know that it is in the US either. I do strongly believe we need the crowd 
We need people to help us. We need effort, we need capacity, and we need to provide tools, interfaces, and guidance and assistance so that we can uh, get the community participating and get citizens out there helping in the way that Galaxy Zoo has been so effective. You all come from a range of different institutions, different characteristics. I hope you'll take back to your institutions some ideas to talk to your colleagues and your peers about how you might address um, supporting open science, because it is going to change. The prospects, I think, are very exciting. They're slightly frightening as well, uh, but they are transformative. And my last slide is a completely shameless plug for the International Digital Curation Conference, which will happen this year in Chicago in December. And I very much hope that I'll see many of you at that conference. So thank you for listening. Thank you. So I don't know whether anyone has questions. I'm happy to answer a few if you have some. I have a question about the citizen science angle that you talked about, because citizen science, uh, you, you promoted that as a concept that we need to leverage. And you hear about that a lot these days. Uh, I know the NSF is very interested in it as an approach for data curation. But um, the scientists that I talk to are incredibly skeptical about that. And there are a couple of good examples that get mentioned every single time, um, you know, identifying star systems and things like that. But uh, they really don't think that it's going to work for the particular type of science that they do. So, you know, is it really worth pursuing that angle if the scientists themselves won't accept the contributions of amateur scientists because they're not really, you know, vetted? What do you think? Well, I think we need to do um, some work to understand what's involved uh, in citizen science, successful citizen science, and think about what, which disciplines it works for and which disciplines it, it perhaps isn't right, recognizing that um, there will be some disciplines, sub-disciplines, where the complexity of the, of the laboratory just doesn't lend itself to someone out there uh, with a web browser um, contributing. But, but equally, I think there are other areas um, where there's real potential. So the Open Science Report really is throwing this idea open and seeking um, comment and views from both the uh, information science community, but also from the research community, from the funders. And, and I know certainly from um, some of the UK research councils, um, public engagement uh, is, is high on their list of drivers to show impact. And I, I don't know if that's also true of, U, of US funders, uh, but what better way to demonstrate impact with the public than to get them involved in your research? Um, and, and, you know, school kids, get them involved right from the start so that they understand the process, they understand the skills that they're going, they could usefully uh, have, and it becomes second nature to them that they, they contribute, they manage data. Uh, I, I think it's quite an exciting possibility, but it won't suit everybody. And um, as with many uh, uh, new things, um, we, we need to understand the perspective of the professional scientist who's well established and, and see where they're coming from as well. I think there's a big discussion to be had in this area and, and ho I hope it will uh, begin now. Okay, uh, I think I'll hand over to Cliff. Thank you. I thank you uh, very much for that um, wide-ranging talk. Uh, I hope it's left uh, everyone with um, a good deal to think about. Um, I'll just mention a couple of quick things. Uh, one, um, the pointer to the report that Liz was referring to is um, on our website and is also in the, um, in the uh, uh, meeting material that you got. And I do urge you to have a look at it. 
Uh, we will put a pointer up to these slides on the CNI website, and as you probably noticed, they're dense with material and URLs and should be a helpful reference. And um, I do also want to point you uh, once again to this uh, International Digital Curation Conference that's happening in Chicago. It's the week before the CNI meeting, and uh, uh, CNI is indeed acting as, once again, as we have with all of these as a co-sponsor. So um, it's an excellent opportunity for uh, digging farther into some of these issues. Please join me once again in thanking Liz uh, for uh, making the trip over and uh, giving us all of this to think about. And with that, we are adjourned. I wish you safe travels. Um, perhaps some of you will have a few moments to enjoy Baltimore before you go. And I look forward to seeing you all in the coming months and certainly in December. Thank you for coming. <laughs>